Now, just like in vehicle surveillance, you want to stay close, but not too close. And this is that, that, that balance, right? That the game of trying to figure out how close you can get to get what you need. Um, but staying far enough back where you're not going to compromise yourself. Foot traffic, just like vehicle traffic, is going to kind of influence the distance that you stay with your person. If there's not a lot of people around, you're going to really loosen up and give them a lot of room. And the reason is, first of all, you don't have to worry about losing them in a crowd so much. Uh, and then also you're more exposed if there's a limited amount of people out there. This really comes down to a lot of common sense. And then again, just assess the behaviors of your subject. And you know, once you establish a baseline when they're on foot, are they real vigilant or are they pretty much incoherent? Are they oblivious? Are they in their phone half the time walking on their phone? Uh, those are going to determine how close you get. Just use good judgment and practice. Corners. Corners can be a challenge. Why? Because when somebody breaks a corner, depending on how many um, doors or different directions they can go, uh, you can lose them really quick. So what you want to do is when somebody does round a corner, then your strategy is to get to the corner quickly as soon as they turn the corner. And of course, let them break line of sight. Get to the corner to see which, you know, are they continuing on in a, in a straight direction or did all of a sudden did they disappear and, and go into a doorway or go in another direction of travel. What I want to do is caution you on running to the corner and looking because people, you're going to draw attention if you're running to the corner. So just walk quickly and uh, you may have seen it even like with, with store level security or loss prevention in retail stores or you know, you're shopping, and I'm maybe more keen on this just because I work a lot of retail cases where you're shopping and you see somebody kind of run by all in a frenzy and they go to the end of a, an aisle or a corner and they start peeking around and pretty obviously they're pretty obvious they're loss prevention. Now you might not be so concerned about them seeing you, but if it's an associate or a friend or depending on where you are, in a neighborhood or at a store, they might have associates that would say, hey, you know what, you were, you were in the store the other day and I saw somebody that looked like they were following you. And so you just wanna avoid drawing attention to yourself. Now let's say you get to the corner and you round that corner and all of a sudden you come face to face with your subject. Like either literally face to face or you go around the corner and I'm talking, this could be outside, this could be in a shopping mall, this could be in a building, it could be in a stadium. We're just talking about corners in general here. Let's say you go around the corner and all of a sudden, there's your subject. They might be doing something uh, and they just happen to turn the corner and they're busy. The main thing is that when you get, when you go around the corner, is that you just don't um, get surprised or look at your subject and all of a sudden you're like, oh, whoa, like I didn't expect you to be there. Uh, don't draw any attention to yourself. And, and don't look at your subject. If you come around the corner and there they are, it's like, well, obviously you're going to be uh, surprised because you didn't expect it, them to be there. But just be natural. Proceed on. And once you get it past them, don't go too far and be nervous about looking back. But give yourself an opportunity to stop after you've preceded them and look to see what they're doing and then try to reestablish uh, your foot surveillance and try to get in a good position once you've um, basically went face to face with them. Okay. The number one thing that you want to avoid in any surveillance, whether you're in a vehicle or you're on foot, no matter where you are, or what you're doing is avoid eye contact. Now it may sound silly, but even when I was watching my career criminals over a number of years, or even watching my drug dealers, my manufacturers, users, whatever it might be, I avoided looking at their face or their eyes, even if I was a quarter mile away, eighth mile away. I avoided looking at their eyes. And, and there's something psychological with us. Uh, maybe it's uh, the part of our brain that, the reptilian part of our brain that detects being watched. But there, there, there is something to people perceiving being watched. And, and usually that is because the eyes, you, you've heard how the eyes are the window to your soul. Like the eyes really are how we establish relationships, communication, 
interest, con, uh, whether somebody is being truthful, the eyes really do play such a huge role. If you make eye contact with a subject, it forms this, whether it's subconscious or not, it has, you've made a connection with that individual. And if your subject looks at you, and it's unavoidable, don't look away. That's going to draw more attention by looking away from your subject. But if you can avoid eye contact, avoid eye contact. So like if you run that corner, you run the corner, your subject's there. Uh, when you're surprised, just look down, like look for your phone, like do something distracting where you don't have to look at their face. Even if they're looking at you, just do something distracting. And then if they, if you felt like, hey, they were kind of looking at me, then that's where you proceed past and then reassess. Are they paying attention to me or did they just look up because I came around the corner? But don't look away. And, um, and even when you're watching somebody through binoculars or in a vehicle, wherever you are, just avoid looking at their, like their eyes. I, I kind of like look at the, their body when I'm watching them. And, and first of all, their head's not going to do anything. So there's no reason necessarily to look at the head unless you need to identify somebody. But um, I, I watch their hands. I watch their body. I avoid looking at their head. So I'm going to tell you a quick story on a situation. It was a private case. And um, a lot of the private cases I worked, uh, they were insurance cases or, you know, they might have been domestic. But usually the subject had no idea they were being followed. So they were relatively easy to do because they were oblivious. They, they weren't criminals that were going to commit a crime that are looking for police or people watching them, witnesses. These people are just going through their normal daily activities, shopping, uh, doing errands, whatever they're doing. They're not necessarily, they're not vigilant on surveillance. They're not looking for surveillance. So this individual, um, I, um, my wife and I were working the case when we're following this woman and we, um, we picked her up at a location. It was a, it was a, well, we followed her from her house to um, a music shop and she went into this music shop and it was a, they sold music equipment and it was during uh, the middle of the day. So there weren't many shoppers. Most people don't go out and look for music equipment in the middle of the day. And, but, um, you know, we we're following her. I had my covert camera and I had a different bottle at that point. And we're going to talk about equipment, right? But I had a bottle that had my little uh, window for my camera, my GoPro is running it, uh, just getting video. Went into that shop, the music shop, and it was just my wife and I and the subject. And the subject was being helped, looking at equipment, and there were three employees in the store, so they kept coming up to my wife and I, do you need help, do you need help? And I'm like, no, no, I'm trying to film and stay close enough to the subject to get video, but not too close to draw attention, and these employees are bothering us. So um, finally I just said, hey, we're good. And I think he kind of got it like, we're interested in the, the other customer and he, and he left us alone. So we watched this person in the store for a while and then they ended up leaving and they went a um, couple stores down to an antique store and they started going through the antique store and it was really tight in there and there were actually more people in there. And because this antique shop was so tight with a lot of corners and, and just um, not junk, but there was a, it was really cluttered. There was a lot of stuff around in order to get video. I had to stay pretty tight. And, um, and again, this, this person was pretty oblivious to us. I mean, really oblivious. Like she was, it was a, she, she was just doing her shopping. Well, at some point, um, I ended up getting right next to her and she was looking at something and, and she, she, um, held something up and she looked directly at me and she goes, do you think my, my boyfriend would like this? And I looked at it and I said, I don't know. And like we were so close, I, I, I couldn't avoid eye contact because she was pretty much right next to me at that point. She goes, you're kind of my husband, my, my boyfriend's size. Uh, I think he would like this. So done issue. I backed away more and gave her a lot of room because like, I, I knew that now like she saw me, we made a connection. She communicated with me, even though I kind of downplayed everything. Like there was that psychological connection made with with uh with our eyes so we ended up following her to another store followed her on the store for a while again she's totally oblivious to everything 
And then at that point, um, she began going home and we thought she was going to pull off into her house, but she continued on and went to a convenience store. This is a pretty big chain convenience store. Uh, there were people in there. And so she went into the store. I gave her a couple minutes and then we followed in. Well, right inside the front of the store was a cosmetic wall with cosmetics and everything. And she was looking at the cosmetics and, and she um, was right inside the door. And so when we came in, she kind of looked over at us and she saw me and she goes, I remember you, you were at that music store. Well, she was close. <laughs> she was a couple doors off, a couple stores off. It wasn't the music store. It was the antique store. And she goes, huh, what a coincidence. It's almost like you're stalking me. And she was joking, but I was trying to feel her out like, um, like, are you really serious or not? But then she just went off and did her thing. And I go, yeah, funny coincidence, right? Well, at that point, that's two sightings, right? And within a, within a close period of time. And so at that point, we pretty much backed out and went to cover the car until she went home because at that point um, she recognized that we were in two different places and you know within a span of time and so you can call that a coincidence right so we say the first time's an accident second time's a coincidence third time's a confirmation and the, we are at the coincidence stage like oh that's funny that's a coincidence like strange if you are spotted three times at three different locations by the by your subject, that's pretty much a burn or a compromise just because the chances of that happening are are pretty rare. And so if you do get spotted two times um, and you have something said, now remember I talked about being burned or compromised and being identified. Like we were we were burned in our sense, like we're we're done, like she can't see us anymore but we weren't burned and compromising the case because she didn't know that we were following her. She just happened to recognize us at two different locations within a span of an hour. So um, that's a, that's the only time I can think of where I've actually been. Um, so I wasn't even really confronted. Remember we told you if somebody thinks they're being followed, they're going to do uh, one of three things or one of four things. So she didn't really confront me, but she, there was a, there was recognition there. And the reason is, is because I made eye contact. She just didn't remember where it was. She was, it wasn't the music store, it was the antique store, but she remembered that, that eye contact and she remembered me. Okay, so if a person enters a building, let's say you're following them mobile um, or you're following them on foot and they go into a building, think about your surveillance objectives. Do you need to follow the person inside the building? Is there any intelligence or evidence that you're going to get? If there isn't, don't follow into the building. Just cover the exits. Just make sure you have all your exits covered. Now, if they showed up in a car, they went into a building, the chances are pretty, pretty high that they're going to come out and get into their car and leave. So when we follow our career criminals, unless there's something we need, evidence-wise or intelligence-wise, we just let them do their shopping, let them go into their wherever they go and do their thing and because the crime isn't going to happen there. So just remember, don't follow just for the sake of following. Consider your surveillance objectives and what, what you're looking for. So now if somebody enters a store, first of all, when they pull into a parking lot, I told you just in the, uh, the last section about vehicle surveillance, you need to stay really tight because first of all, um, when they pull into a parking lot, you're going to be at the mercy of wherever the parking spots are. Now, um, when I was in law enforcement, I utilized uh, the the handicapped parking spots quite a bit. I actually had a little placard that I could put up, and that would allow me to get into stores really quick. Uh, I don't have a handicap placard on the private sector. Have I used some handicapped parking spots temporarily? Yes. Um, usually I don't leave my vehicle though. I'll just park in the handicap spot to see where my subject goes and then I'll either move and get out. Or if I'm not following a person in, I'll just stay in the handicap spot to see where they went. So I know, and then I'll reposition when a, when a position in a parking lot comes open. But as soon as your subject parks in a parking lot and they get out on foot and they go into a building or a mall, 
if you are going in, go in immediately um, and enter at least at the same time with your subject if you can or trail behind. So like let's use a Walmart for example. Walmart usually has what like three entrances. It has uh, entrance on the right, entrance on the left, and then usually a garden center entrance. So I've had a lot of suspects that when I work retail cases, they like the garden entrance just because there's less scrutiny coming in. They don't see the door greeter or receipt checker. And, and so they'll go through the garden center, kind of like coming in covertly. And so when they do that, I'll either trail behind going into the garden center, which is usually pretty easy to do. Or when I see them going into the garden center, I'll just go into the entrance closest to the garden center and watch for them to come out of the garden center into the store, because that's usually what they do. But the main thing is you want to get in um, as soon as you can to not lose them. I've tell, like I've lost so many suspects in stores just because they got in and I didn't know what direction they went. And now you're circling the store and watching the registers and it's just, it's really hard to find them. And if you're working a retail case, you want to be on them because by the time you find them, they might've already committed the crime and they're done. So don't lose visual. And um, depending on, like if you're in law enforcement and, and your suspect enters a store, you can usually get with loss prevention and badge them and just say, hey, I'm following a suspect. Uh, do you have cameras? Can you help me follow them through with cameras? If there's loss prevention at the store, then partner with them and let them watch them on camera so you're not out on the floor trying to see what they're doing. And, and loss prevention is usually pretty, pretty helpful. Uh, just because they don't want a bad person or a suspect in their store either. The problem I've had is sometimes loss prevention or security can be counterproductive. Um, I was working a large case of, there were boosters, retail thieves that were hitting shopping centers like malls and they entered a mall and I got with security right away because they were targeting a lot of different uh, retail businesses in this mall. So I got with security and told them, hey, we're following this crew. Can you help us out with watching them in the common areas? And then we'd watch them in the stores, like the little boutique stores. The problem is, is security gets interested and they're thinking, ooh, we got like an active cool case going on. Undercover police are here. And all of a sudden this area where these suspects were, like security guards started showing up. And I mean, we had like four that were just kind of just loitering in the area like, uh, they're just chilling, wanting to see what was going on. Well, our suspects picked up immediately that all of a sudden there was a heavy security presence in their area and they left. And uh, fortunately, before security had showed up, they actually committed some thefts. And so we were, we were able to get them stopped after a pursuit and they got in a foot in a, a vehicle pursuit helicopter got involved in all that and and they were arrested but security scared them out of them all our, our strategy was to let them do the thefts and we we're going to arrest them at the car and, and we were in the works with getting patrol units there to assist us when they returned to their car but but security kind of interrupted it and made them leave before we were set up and so that's what happened but so it can be counterproductive because you can draw more attention to what you're doing. And if you want to keep it really covert or on the down low, don't involve loss prevention. Now, I don't have a specific section in here about casinos. And uh, I know there's um, some investigators in the casino industry that uh, are, are watching this course uh, because uh, we have done some work with them. And so I want to tell you from a civilian or a law enforcement standpoint about casinos. If they're on sovereign land and they're under different laws, then uh, there's, there's protocols like that casino police have to follow and casinos themselves don't want law enforcement or private investigators roaming through their, their casinos and on their property. They wanna be notified. So um, I, I'm just going to be transparent with you. Um, I I followed a lot of people to casinos, a lot of our, our nighttime commercial burglars or well, even our residential burglars, daytime residential burglars. A lot of these individuals would go hang out at the casino in Arizona, 
prior to doing their either their nighttime crime or they'd be there during the the nighttime and then during the day they go do their residential burglaries and we we literally follow them right from the casino and they do start doing burglaries so um what i'm going to be transparent about is is like we didn't notify casino uh police because we weren't going to arrest first of all we weren't going to arrest him on the casino property or in indian land and so we were just watching them waiting for them to leave and the reason i don't notify the casino were there and all the security i can tell you right now like the cameras and casinos the security and casinos is like pretty much top notch cameras everywhere can probably read you know, read the serial number off the dollar bill if you put it out in front of your hand, right? The cam cameras are awesome. And you can only loiter so long at a casino before you're gonna draw attention. So if you're in a casino doing a surveillance, you need to do something to fit in. Uh, otherwise, the security's gonna pick up on you right away. And it, it's happened a few times. <laughs> and uh, so I, I've contacted the casino before when I've gone on, uh, it was actually a counterfeiting case. I went in there, person was, uh, laundering counterfeit money and i went in there talked to the casino security i said hey we're following the counterfeit uh, she was a female she's doing counterfeit and he goes okay well you can't follow her in here until we get the police to show up and i go you're kidding me he goes nope as a matter of fact you have to wait outside so i'm waiting outside of this casino while my suspect's in there doing whatever she's doing uh, waiting for the tribal police to show up um and and those guys are great. Uh, like I'm not faulting the like the the tribal police, uh, the casino. Like they have laws, protocols, policies they follow. They're just doing their job, it, but I have to do my job too. And so by the time the the cop got there, he's like, he's like, oh yeah, tell you, yeah, let's go, uh, you know, let's go get with the cameras guys and all that. And so by the time we got in the room to look at the cameras, our suspect was already going out to leave. So it uh, it was counterproductive. Like I have no idea what she did, and I even told the casino, "I'm like, you can look at your cameras. You know what she looks like now. You can see if she did any crimes here, and deal with it because we're moving on." And so it was counterproductive in that situation. And so when I go to casinos now and do surveillance, I blend in the best I can. I watch my subject. I don't let the casino know. I don't let law enforcement know because I'm not going to get what I need. I'm, um, I would tell you that do what you need to do policy wise, regulation wise, if you're law enforcement and, and when I'm telling you this, like I was a, I was a law enforcement official following this counterfeiter into the casino. This wasn't a private case. I was law enforcement and they told me I had to wait outside and yeah, it got me kind of angry. Cause I'm like, like, this is ridiculous. Like, you're a victim now. And so, so I'm just telling you, I've had, I haven't had good luck. And again, they're doing their job. I'm not faulting anybody for doing their job. Um, but you have a job to do, do. So figure out what you need to do. I'm not telling you to break any laws. So don't, don't, don't read that out of this. Let's talk about hotels. Let's say you've been following somebody on the road for a while, mobile surveillance, they pull into a hotel. You've probably been there before, not at the hotel, but in the situation before. And your subject gets out, one or two get out. A lot of the repeat offenders we followed, they would get hotels every like night by night. Or the people I travel and follow across the country, they're, they just stay in hotels. And so I might follow them for a day. I got to put them down at a hotel. And so I'll follow them at least till they go to a hotel or wherever they're going to sleep for the night. So one of the little tips with hotels is let's say you've been following for a while. They go into a hotel. You want to, your objective is usually to figure out what room they're in. So you know where they're going to be. Usually the subject is going to go to the desk. Sometimes you can get close enough to, to hear what room they're going to get. Uh, it, it, I usually don't use that strategy to try to get in close to listen. I just wait until they get the room and then I follow them to see which room they go to. Now in Arizona um, and even a lot of States where they have the hotels with the doors on the outside, it's, it's really easy. You just watch the car up front, subject goes in, gets their room and, and I don't even follow them in. Like I don't usually use the strategy of going in to listen 
I just wait till they go in and get their room, come out to the car and park. So if it's an, uh, in a, a hotel with outside doors, it's real easy. They go park, you see what room they go into, you're done. If it's an internal hotel where all the rooms are inside, like an embassy suites or, or some of the other chains that have rooms inside, then I still use the same strategy because they go get their key, they go park, and then they haul all their stuff inside. And that's when I follow them to see where they go. If you have been following somebody on the road for a while, they go into a hotel, uh, they pull in, they go inside, and you're going in to follow them to see if they meet with somebody. Maybe they're not getting a night, and you go in and you don't see them anywhere. Usually, they're in the bathroom. You're you're in and. Hopefully they're in the bathroom. Usually that's where I've found them. I just see where the, the room is, the restroom. And sure enough, they'll come out. Why? Because they've been on the road. They have to go to the bathroom. It's the first thing they do when they when they park and go in. Um, but, but stay tight um, if, if you can, like when they go in. Because if they're going to buy drugs or they're going to meet with somebody and they're bypassing the front desk because they're not staying there, then you want to know what room they're going to. And generally... If you have a partner, like one person will stay pretty tight with them to see what room they go into. And then you kind of have exposed yourself. And so you just kind of back out a little bit and then have your partner or another person, in the team take the eye. But again, in the situation, is a crime going to occur at the hotel? Do you really, does it really matter? Or do you just want to focus on maintaining an eye on the car and waiting for your subject to come out to the car and continue on? Those are things that your, your objectives will determine. Let's talk about bars and nightclubs. Those you wanna usually follow them in right away. Follow them in. You know, in bars, in restaurants, a lot of times the light levels are low, they're crowded. So the first investigator is really doing the, um, the following men to see where they go. And so once you go in, it's kind of like the hotel, the first investigator is kind of exposing themselves to see where they're, where your subject is going to sit either get a table or where they're meeting somebody and then they go in and typically if you have the opportunity, let's say you want to do surveillance in a bar or a restaurant, select the bar area. Envision like a Chili's restaurant where from the Chili's bar, a lot of times you can see about two thirds of the restaurant and in a bar allows you to choose the table to get the best view. And then also it allows you the ability to, to prepay or pay and and be ready to leave and not be dependent um, at least with some restaurants where you can pay at the table not be dependent on the waiter or waitress to come and give you your check and all that if you if you do uh, so let's say so set up in the bar if you have the option if you want to get a table near your suspect or subject to get information maybe overhear something then you can request, you know, with a hostess, hey, I want to sit over there. Some areas you, that you want to avoid are TVs, even in the bar area. And then also when you're sitting in the bar area, try to sit to as far to the rear as practical. And the reason why you want to avoid being by a TV is that the, the TV draws attention, right? So if your subject or suspect sees the TV there and they're into whatever's on the TV, they're going to be looking over there uh, quite often. And then being to the rear just gives you a, um, a, a better view of the, the restaurant and what's going on or in the bar area. It's kind of applicable for bars and restaurants. And then if you're backlit, that's the best. Where if you're backlit, then you're your the lighting kind of washes you out a little bit so i want to give you a quick scenario where like i violated just about every one of these and that's just because it happens sometimes it was just because that's the only opportunity i had it was all that was available I followed this this guy into a restaurant and he selected a table by the window i went into the bar area there was only one area to sit so i sat there the tv was right over my head and he was backlit and so like he was looking over at the TV all the time. And at first I didn't even realize it was up there. I just grabbed the, the table cause it was the only table and he kept looking over and I'm thinking, is he looking at me? And then all of a sudden I realized, Oh, there's a TV above me. Great. And then him, I couldn't even see very well. And I got terrible video because he was backlit from outside. So there the tables were turned and uh, that happens sometimes. All right. So in a, in a nutshell, if a person goes into a building 
and you don't need to follow your subject in there. If you have two investigators, you can cover four sides of a building. So just use that tactic there. Don't even go in, just make sure you got the exits covered. And then if you do have to go in, stay as close as reasonably possible, but then not too close to draw attention. Again, a lot of this depends on the vigilance, the vigilant level of your subject. I wanna give you an example here of, so this is an area in Phoenix, it's actually 7th Avenue and Van Buren, and this is McDonald's right here. We actually followed a guy from jail. Um, we put him in jail the night before for a burglary. He got out, and um, if I didn't mention it before, our strategy with the repeat offender program surveillance team was usually, we, we targeted career criminals with two prior felonies, and a lot of times when they got arrested, um, when they're out, you know, they, they didn't have any, they had a record, but they didn't have anything pending. The first time you get arrested, they release you on bond or um, OR, they call it, own recognizance. And so a lot of our repeat offenders would get out until their court date. Well, when they do get released, they are released on bond or on OR, own recognizance. And if they get arrested again, it's a violation. And they're non-bondable, meaning if they're out on a felony charge, walk in the streets and you get them arrested again, they're non-bondable until court. And a repeat offender, it doesn't matter that they got arrested and released. They're a repeat offender, career criminal, drug addict, they're gonna go do their thing. And so we would put a lot of them in jail. The first surveillance would be real covert, call in police, get them arrested, put them in jail. They don't, they don't even know how they got arrested. They don't know a surveillance team did surveillance, got them arrested, put them in jail. And so we'd tell the jail, we'd put a, it's called a jail file stop. The jail would call us when they're gonna release the suspect. And so usually it was within 24 hours. Sometimes if they had to come up with bond, it might've been a couple of days, maybe it was a week, two weeks. Sometimes it was longer, it didn't matter. We put a jail file stop and the jail would call us and say, hey, we're releasing Joe Blow uh, at 6 a.m. And we'd go down to the jail, set up surveillance. And when Joe Blow, the, 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 um, jail intake people would tell us real time like okay he's going to be coming out with a group of five they'll be uh, he's wearing tan shorts and a red shirt and it's like well yeah we, we know what he was wearing but we appreciate it because we put him in jail but they'd be telling us what they're wearing and then when they're going to come out and sure enough they'd come out with a group there would be our suspect carrying their prisoner property bag with their stuff in it and their wallet and we'd follow them so in this situation we followed them from the jail which is about I would say about a half mile south of here on 7th Ave. And we followed this person on foot. And this is early in the morning. We followed him all the way up to this McDonald's right here. And this, this area right here is really rough. I mean, this hotel, uh, really rough. As a matter of fact, I think they leveled it um, not too long ago and put something else there. But our suspect went into the McDonald's. We set up surveillance out here to cover it. And we're doing surveillance and covering it and like a half hour later our subject didn't come out and we're like because again we didn't need to go in there for any reason and so but an, a half hour later maybe it even was approaching an hour we're like well this is weird like nobody spends that much time in a mcdonald's and i don't even know if he had any money so we're, we're like hey somebody go in there and see what he's doing so we sent an investigator in investigator said uh oh, there's a there's a door on the north side of the mcdonald's so we're like, oh, you're kidding me. Like he basically went in, did whatever he did, went out the north door, nobody's covering the north door, gone. So, he, and he was transient. Like we had no idea where to pick him up. So you just have to wait until you either locate him or get a, a file stop off the street from a patrol officer saying, hey, we got your guy. So make sure you cover all the exits. Let's talk about the ABC method or the three main shadow, whatever you want to call it. Um, this concept has been around for many years. Uh, I don't really utilize it textbook style. Uh, I utilize pretty much what I what we just went through, but I want to explain this because uh, you may hear the ABC method or you he may hear the three man shadow. And, and this is really just kind of common sense of following somebody on foot. And so let's go ahead and look at this right here. So here's your subject. You have surveillance A, B, and C. And this is kind of the standard where you would have a couple behind or a couple on the other side of the street, one behind, 
and, and really it's just a model. And as the subject does certain things, you just kind of change up your surveillance to, to uh, continue on as they, as they change direction. So let's go ahead and look at it. Again, uh, I just use more common sense when I'm doing foot surveillance and it's, uh, it's kind of just I don't know, common sense if you want to call it that. So here, here's like an altern, alternative positioning where you have somebody, <coughs> sorry, you have somebody leading the subject, then you have surveillance B and then surveillance C. And then your subject is pretty much sandwiched in. So let's say your subject takes a right turn. So here's your subject in red. Subject takes a right turn on the street. Surveillance A goes over and crosses Surveillance C crosses here, and then surveillance B will follow in. So basically, all they're doing is swapping out positions, and then you end up back with your original ABC method. Let's say your subject turns left at an intersection. So here's your subject turning left, crosswalk. The person that's on the opposite side of the street just crosses over and now is gonna be on the opposite side of the street as a subject and then surveillance A and B just drop in behind. So all these maneuvers <clears throat> pretty much just get you back to this scenario right here. And again, this can be a variation of your, your subject. You, there could be one over here and two over here, but you, you prefer to have two on the same side just because uh, you don't have traffic issues of crossing traffic and vehicles and all that. All right, so let's say the subject crosses the street and then turns right. So your subject crosses the street, takes a right turn and then surveillance A might continue on like they're just gonna continue on and there's most likely there would be a building here, right? So once subject A continues on, he does a U-turn and basically will drop in. Surveillance B will drop in over here and then surveillance C will drop in. So you end up with two behind your subject again and one on the opposite side of the street. So just think, usually you have two behind your subject one on the opposite side of the street. And they're just uh, basically another eye. They're in a position to assume whatever role you, that's needed when your subject makes a direction change. So here we go, another example. Subject crosses and turns left. So here your subject crosses the road, turns left. Now surveillance A crosses the road, turns left. Surveillance B assumes that position on the opposite side of the street. And surveillance C, will continue on like he's just walking on and then does a U-turn, comes back and drops in behind the subject. You see what this is? Three-man shadow, ABC method. It's not complicated, just common sense. And this is really what you're looking for is going back to this model here. And as your subject um, commits and does certain actions, you just respond or react, whatever word you prefer, to assume the position of this. Pretty elementary. So let's talk about foot surveillance into a building briefly. We kind of touched on it with getting on your subject immediately, and that's because if your subject gets into a building, and especially a mall, and you're not right on them or see which direction they go in the mall, you can lose them very easily. So this is an example of a mall. Here's an entrance right here. Let's say your subject pulls in and the subject pulls in and they travel over here and they get lucky and they find a parking spot right here. And then you're behind them and you have no parking spots over here and your only parking spot is like over here. So now, you park here, and if again, if you have two people in a car, anytime we did surveillance at a mall or a store or a building, and there's two people in the car, and you're pretty sure, well, they're you're pretty sure they're going to ground, then I just dump somebody out immediately at the sidewalk. So you pull in, you drop off your your second surveillance um, on the sidewalk, and then they can pick them up as soon as they come from their car. Just kind of a no-brainer. But if you're operating solo, and they park right here and you end up parking here and they get out and they're heading for that entrance and you're over here, you don't wanna be following right behind because by the, like if you're over here, you jump over to the sidewalk, when they hit that door and go in, and, and most malls, they're big glass doors and you can see in those malls and you can see which direction they go. 
if they pop go to that door and you come over here and you run up like this and then you're going to follow them in when they go in there you're not going to know if they go left right straight you're just not going to have an idea why because you can't see so what you want to do is they park they're heading for that entrance you park here cut through traffic or cut through the parking lot like this cut through like this and then come up straight like this why because then when your subject goes in you can hold the eye through the glass doors and you can see oh did they turn left did they turn right did they go straight ahead at least you have more uh more of a physical eye going straight up to see where they go does that make sense and this strategy works really well because if you go into a mall and you don't know which way they went, oh, it's good luck finding somebody in a mall unless you know what stores they're going to. It's, it's just really a challenge.